All right, thank you again to the John Muir Elementary School recording, uh, recorder um, club. club, yeah. So I'm now gonna hand it over to Dr. Nyland for the superintendent's comments. Thank you. Uh, this evening I wanna uh, give some highlights from our strategic plan, touch on a few of the hot topics, uh, a little bit of the good news and some of the presentations and visits that we've been out making. So under our uh, strategic plan, uh, we have three major goals, our uh, academics, excellence and equity, our systems, and um, our community engagement. We promised uh, to the board uh, for MTSS and the EOG uh, that uh, by June, we would have uh, clearer definitions of what those look like, uh, some brochures to go with it, uh, school by school uh, reports on how we're doing, uh, and ways uh, in which we plan to replicate the good work that we're seeing in our schools. I, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I won't take time to go into the details tonight, but uh, there's been several things that have happened even this week where I'm excited about the arrows that are coming together as different groups uh, begin to align their work around uh, those SMART goals that the board has set uh, for us. And we'll continue to bring, uh, we don't have any tonight, but we'll continue to bring some of our positive outliers before the board. Next uh, board meeting is scheduled for West Seattle. Our principal uh, leadership learning day uh, was Tuesday, and uh, we had the opportunity to introduce principals uh, to the since time immemorial uh, curriculum, which is part of the state law in terms of providing that curriculum to our students across the district. Uh, Kyle Kenoshita, working with our uh, Indian Education Department, has uh, found a way to get funding so that we can roll out that training for all of our fourth grade teachers over the next several weeks. We also had uh, Dr. Stephanie Freiberg here. She's from the University of Washington and uh, one of the nationally known researchers on identity safety. And she talked about uh, why it's important to have students uh, have opportunities at school to see students like themselves uh, or adults uh, doing well in school so that they can uh, be both comfortable with their culture and their heritage at school and uh, be comfortable in an academic. Uh, I too can have these dreams of uh, continuing with my education. I also uh, at that principal meeting had the opportunity to um, share with uh, our school leaders expectations regarding testing and uh, the opt-out refus refusal process, asking them to uh, certainly uh, share the advantages which we see for the assessments and at the same time to respect the students and families uh, who wish to opt out. And then uh, had a simpler opportunity with the assistant principals uh, a week ago uh, to talk with them about our formula for success, the information that we presented to the board on March 8th, and to share with them uh, <laughs> the really good news for that group. Uh, I don't know what that group is. That group's about 80 people, and uh, the worst case budget scenario would have had them losing 26 AP positions, which would have been about a third of the people in that room. Uh, so they were delighted to know that uh, the board uh, approval of Restoration 1.0 uh, would bring back 19 of those positions and then the Restoration 2.0, which hadn't quite happened at that point in time, will bring back a few more. So uh, not able to bring, just like teachers, we're not quite able to bring everyone back, but uh, a huge uh, move in the right direction. And then systems, uh, <laughs> board's tired of hearing this. Uh, we uh, are really challenged in the budget with our initially $74 million uh, budget gap uh, caused by the $30 million levy cliff and the $40 million in compensation that the state has a responsibility for. Uh, we've been uh, kind of on a three-part journey with regard to that. Part of it is uh, working with the legislature. They've gone uh, dark a little bit right now in terms of uh, behind the scenes negotiations between the House and the Senate. But our staff has been diligently working in Olympia and we thank, uh, can't thank enough our partners, uh, PTA, uh, Paramount Duty, SEA, uh, pass uh, so many of our partners that have been with us uh, in that endeavor. And then we've been communicating regularly 
almost weekly with uh, all, of our, all of our partners. Thank you to the board. Uh, we've done Restoration 1.0, which brought back uh, about 175 of the 250 positions that were included in the worst case scenario. And then uh, Restoration 2.0 that we went over on Monday that made further uh, restorations. Uh, so again, uh, thank you to the board for lots and lots and lots of work. We do uh, anticipate um, with hmm, a, a fairly high degree of hope that there will be Restoration 3.0, which uh, w should be the remainder of the levy cliff funds that we lost. Both House and Senate budget do have a per pupil inflator uh, in their budget, so we're hopeful that that means uh, a, a return of at least the lost six million that we had lost. And then uh, the House budget is much better than the other two budgets, and we hope that there might be restoration 4.0 in terms of uh, some additional funding coming back from the legislature. Although none of those budgets will make us whole uh, for this year or for the year after that. So um, despite the promises of McCleary uh, and despite moving in the right direction, uh, it looks like it's still going to be uh, some time in the future before we get back to a place where we have sustainable budgets. Under uh, community engagement, um, had the opportunity uh, last week to visit with the Stevens uh, PTSA and to engage with them, talk about our budget issues, talk about our uh, initiatives to provide excellence and equity for all of our students, and then to take uh, a lot of their questions. They were particularly interested in how we do uh, our boundaries and our enrollment. Uh, in their case, they have a waiting list uh, for uh, parents in the neighborhood who would like to come to their school. In Leshai, a neighboring school is uh, full to overflowing, so they wanted to know why we couldn't move the boundary, and so we'll have to get back to them on some of the details. But fairly, uh, yeah, uh, we get these questions often in terms of, hmm, uh, changing the boundaries, as we know, uh, is a challenging uh, is a challenge that would take more than just saying, okay, we'll move the boundary tonight and change it so that we balance out the enrollment. Uh, last night we met with Hamilton P PTSA. I was joined by Director Burke, thank you, and Dwayne Chappelle from the city, and the principal, uh, Tip Blish. And uh, wow, they, uh, they uh, have good staying power at Hamilton. Uh, we were there for two hours uh, with lots of uh, Q&A a lot of interest in the uh, highly capable uh, program, lots of interest in dual language, uh, and lots and lots of interest in Lincoln. So I was glad to have uh, Director Burke there because he's uh, been uh, studying that in great depth. And uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of people hung around afterwards. We ended at nine and we were still there at 9.20 or so. Uh, so it was a great, uh, great conversation. Um, and then, uh, Director Harris and I was uh, at the uh, Thrive by Five uh, lunch yesterday. I got to hear Jeffrey Canada. Uh, well, what a deli delightful presenter. I can see why he can raise the, what was it, $60 million that uh, he was raising for the Harlem's Children's Zone. And uh, other than, uh, I mean, that Seattle U is doing incredible work at $2 million, and we're very grateful, but same idea, kind of, you know, 100 blocks. Uh, you know, what can we do to really target resources and figure out what else uh, we need to do to uh, close gaps for kids. And then uh, our family survey will be coming out right after uh, spring break, so we can look for that. A couple of hot topic items. Uh, we've, uh, we've had a, a lot of emails with regard to option school funding. Um, and see, can I explain that in, in a, a simple way? Uh, our option schools, many of them, not all, uh, rely on uh, a number of <coughs> students coming into kindergarten and then rolling up to first grade and second grade and third grade so that you keep the enrollment of the school up. Uh, with the state change in smaller class sizes at the primary grades, that means that you've got a whole bunch of primary grades at 
17, 19, 20 students. And when they roll up into the upper grades, you want them to have the 28, 29, 30 students that we're required to have on our funding formula. So that really creates a no-win situation uh, for all of us uh, in that uh, it's really hard to do business the way that we've done it in the past, and we don't want to constrain the enrollment and say we're going to starve you to death by having small kindergarten classes that will then create smaller uh, classes in grades four and five. Uh, so the initial uh, request from those on the uh, WSS committee was that uh, we uh, staff them differently so that they wouldn't be constricted in those lower grades. Uh, other option schools said, hmm, we don't think we like that uh, arrangement. So uh, we're now, I don't know quite how to say this, I should probably just read my script, but uh, we're now providing uh, the same number of staff to the option schools as we would to any other school based on their enrollment and uh, we're giving them more flexibility in how they use the staff. Uh, so that may translate. Uh, we heard a lot of parents saying, no, 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 we want smaller class size. In many cases, the schools are saying, we want the teachers, but we want to even out class size across K-5 uh, because we want to have a consistent pipeline moving through the grades. So that's what we've done. We've funded them the same as we funded everybody else, and we've given them more flexibility so that they can uh, use teachers uh, more flexibly across all of their grades. And then uh, ethnic studies uh, has been, um, we've had uh, several people at our, at our meetings uh, testifying in support of that. Uh, the curriculum and instruction committee has uh, looked at it a couple of times. Uh, we continue to look at it as a staff and we'll be having a resolution that'll come back uh, to the board. Uh, and very uh, very uh, good research from Stanford uh, around it in terms of increased attendance and increased uh, GPA. So we're hopeful that we can be creative in our funding uh, challenges and find a way to uh, benefit from that, uh, that research and figuring out what we do. We are learning that we have a lot of really good things uh, going on in the district. We have a lot of really good things on paper that we're not sure are going on in the district. Uh, and we just need to pull all of those together and make sure that we have a consistent, coherent uh, program district-wide. Good news, uh, and I'll just highlight uh, some of these as uh, we uh, move through those. Um, I think we reported on this earlier that uh, we received 3,000 uh, books uh, from U.S. Representative John Lewis that uh, will help with our uh, yeah, providing library materials or st uh, books in the hands of students uh, with regard to equity and elimination of opportunity gaps. So we're grateful for that gift. Uh, Danny Middle School had a STEM uh, fair that was a huge success. I think the uh, West Seattle paper has uh, a lot of those uh, photos up on their, uh, on their website. Congratulations to Danny for that. Uh, <coughs> Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, family support worker Valerie Fisher is being recognized uh, by the Washington Education Association for her dedication and commitment to supporting girls through a group that she founded, uh, Girls of Color. Uh, 200 students uh, and teachers from the Seattle area, including, uh, well, I guess Argentina and Chile wouldn't be in the Seattle area, but anyway, including students from uh, Argentina and Chile uh, were at Chief Self uh, International High School recently. This is the third year in a row that they've sponsored a uh, global issues uh, network, and I was pleased to have the opportunity to welcome the uh, students to that uh, event, and thank you to Noah for the work that he does to put that together every year. Uh, 70 students from Ballard High School's Wind Ensemble will travel soon to New York City in April to play at Carnegie Hall. Uh, and eight students from uh, Nathan Hale High School's uh, radio station, their advanced digital media program, won awards at the 10th annual Washington State High School Radio Conference and Awards uh, this month. And I think I'm missing a bunch of them. I think, uh, yeah, Nathan Hale also uh, did well at the track meet, I think. So, uh, more of that is available on the district website. 
presentations and visits uh, in the last uh, week or so. Uh, we had the Seattle Housing Authority here uh, for a joint meeting uh, earlier this week. And similar, you saw uh, the head of Seattle Housing Authority in that uh, video from uh, Seattle U. Uh, they are partnering with us on attendance. Uh, they've helped uh, with registration. Uh, they had early registration for kindergarten for us, uh, right where the families live, so that uh, made that much better for the parents and earlier for us. Uh, and they continue to find uh, places uh, for many of our homeless students so that they can find a home uh, in the attendance area where the child is going to school. So that's a huge gift, uh, again, to the families first and foremost, but also to our schools to keep that continuity for our students. We met uh, recently uh, with the president and staff from South Seattle College and I won't remember all these numbers the right way, but I, I think it's six to eight million dollars that their foundation has raised over the last uh, 10 years or so for our 13th year there, 13th year Promise Scholarships, and they've expanded now from uh, Cleveland to Rainier Beach to, I'm missing one, they just added West Seattle. West Seattle. Right. Self has been part of the original. Self, okay. Uh, so up to four schools, so basically telling all of our seniors that you graduate on time and you sign up to go to Seattle colleges and you will be provided a scholarship for your first year, your 13th year. And we know that if students sign up for the 13th year, they're a whole lot more likely to complete. We know that the 13th year is one of the markers for uh, a family wage uh, job and we know that the 13th year is worth doubling of lifetime earnings over what a dropout would get. So uh, just a, a huge gift. And then the city uh, has uh, provided uh, seed money for uh, Central Seattle College and North Seattle College to expand the program to at least one high school in their region. So uh, the dream uh, is that eventually uh, we, they, together, all of us, uh, can promise every senior uh, and kind of starting early, every kindergarten student, you can get a scholarship if you uh, stay in school, uh, graduate, and uh, are ready to go to college. So what a great uh, gift around our uh, EOG work and uh, just a gift for all of Seattle. And then uh, the Winners for Life event that Rot Rotary does every year is just absolutely incredible. Uh, they uh, identify 11th and 12th graders from across the district, each of our high schools who have overcome significant challenges uh, to uh, get to graduation or uh, be on track to graduate, and then provide scholarships for the seniors. Uh, so, wow, uh, kind of both tear jerkers and heartwarming at the same time uh, for the challenges that the students have overcome and the grit and determination uh, that they have uh, displayed. So. I got to uh, congratulate the students in a little ceremony before uh, the lunch, and then uh, Dwayne Chappelle was the keynote speaker at lunch and did an excellent job of encouraging all of us as well as uh, the students. Uh, last item uh, coming up on tonight's agenda is uh, an approval by the board for the Satterberg grant. Uh, we've recognized the Neshulm Family Foundation earlier for the work that they've helped us do at uh, Danny, Aki, and Mercer. And uh, they uh, reached out and recruited the Satterberg family to help provide for uh, feeder pattern so that we could uh, reach uh, elementary school students even earlier and have them come prepared to those middle schools even better ready to learn. And uh, so the board approved a Satterberg grant earlier, and as they got in involved in the work, uh, they doubled down on it and came back and they said, we want to do even more. So uh, yeah, uh, that was what I started out tonight with around our EOG work. Uh, our arrows are lining up uh, internally. We've got a lot of exciting things happening, and then externally, uh, between the mayor's office and the city funding and the Satterbergs and the Nesh Homes and so many others uh, are coming together to help make uh, that dream of eliminating opportunity gaps uh, come a little bit closer. So 
there is at the back table a summary of uh, our recent and upcoming community meetings and I believe that there's also some information back there with regard to option schools and uh, ethnic studies. So next week I've heard is spring break. I'm hopeful that we'll actually have spring weather for the benefit of our uh, students and staff and uh, hope that the rest of us get uh, a little bit of time to enjoy spring break. Thank you, Dr. Nyland. So has our student representative been able to make it tonight? No? Okay, perhaps next time. So that now brings us then to the consent um, portion of tonight's agenda. Director Petu, I understand that you would like to make a comment. I am recusing myself from participating and will abstain from voting on the consent agenda because I have a relative on tonight's personnel report. Thank you very much. May I have a motion for the consent agenda? I move approval of the consent agenda. I second the motion. Okay. Approval of the consent agenda has been moved and seconded. Do directors have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The consent agenda has passed. Okay. So it is um, not yet 5.30, which is when we begin our public testimony. So I will now turn to um, board directors and see if anybody would like to begin their comments with always the option to continue their comments after we've heard from the public, because we are almost always inspired by what we hear and like to respond to what we hear from the public. So do any directors have, would anyone like to uh, begin? Director Pinkham. <coughs> uh, good evening, uh, Tots Kalawit, and uh, thank you. I just want to probably just take this time right now just to make a few announcements uh, for events that are coming up. I wanted to remind people, if you haven't heard yet, the University of Washington is having its annual spring powwow this weekend, April 8th and 9th at the Alaska Airlines Arena, or HECA Pavilion. Grand entry times on Saturday are at noon and 6 p.m. and on Sunday at noon. And they'll also have a coastal jam on Friday at 5. So if you want to Swing by the University of Washington this weekend if you have the time and enjoy the power that's on campus. Um, do invite you to come by. Uh, and also, I wanted to recognize that today um, is the Global Day of the Engineer, where we recognize the contributions that engineers have provided to uh, this world. And as you think about it, you know, what, what are the top engineering achievements uh, over these past few decades and actually the past 20th century, you know. It's the education that we're providing these students as they learn their, the math and science skills and then how to apply those so we can make advancements that's better for our society. And uh, <coughs> according to the greatachievements.org list, uh, we can see that the number one thing that the engineers have done in the past 20th century is electrification. Without electricity, a lot of the other things that make this top <laughs> 20 list wouldn't even be possible. So just wanted to give a shout out uh, for that, uh, given that I work in the College of Engineering at the University of Washington, and encourage students to look at STEM fields as a potential career as they move forward. Because we do need the diverse perspectives of not just, uh, well, we need the diverse perspectives of everyone in the engineering field, because uh, your view and perspectives count as we move forward in this uh, global uh, society. Uh, I also want to let you know, I guess I can right now, that my next community meeting will be Saturday, April 29th. I know it's still a ways away, and that will be from uh, 10 a.m. to 11.30 at Broadview uh, Library. And those are really just a quick uh, announcements I wanted to make before uh, we get to the <coughs> community comments or public testimony, and I'll save some more time to comment later. Katsaya, thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else care to uh, share some comments at this time? Director Blanford. 
I will try to keep mine brief. Um, a, a appreciation again for Gwendolyn Jemerson and um, the recognition that she received. Uh, it seemed well earned and uh, what I was most impressed with was how busy it seems that she is. She uh, keeps her hands in lots of different pots and I think that's a great uh, exemplar that um, many in our community should follow. Um, appreciation also for the Seattle U presentation that was done today. Um, I have the opportunity, well, first off, I live in the community where they do their work and I frequently see students uh, leaving from the university campus headed to the um, various schools in the neighborhood and frequently hear from students and parents who live in the neighborhood as well about the uh, incredible work that is done with the Seattle U students that are there. So um, I was very pleased when I saw that they were on the agenda today to receive recognition. Um, our partnerships are critically important, particularly in this time when we're struggling with our budgetary challenges. It is so incredibly important that we um, build strong partnerships with community-based organizations and then also recognize them for the incredible work that they do with and for us. Um, and it was so great to see the John Muir um, Music Recorders Club present today. As I've mentioned many times, it is a wonderful opportunity and helps to ground us in the work that we have to do um, when we get the opportunity to see kids performing and to see the um, hard work that their teachers uh, provide and what it does for our children. So it was a wonderful experience. And I will close by noting the fact that um, I spent a half an hour this morning in the um, various libraries in the neighborhood that I live in trying to secure a location for a community meeting. Unfortunately, in neither of the two libraries are there any times available on a Saturday, so um, I am looking for other spots. I did not have a meeting in March, and so my hope is to be able to get one scheduled uh, in April uh, if I can find a location. If not, maybe we'll host it in my living room, um, though, though I hope we don't resort to that, that outcome because I don't think that would be good for anyone concerned. But um, stay tuned. I think... Uh, as soon as I have a meeting schedule locked in, I'll be sure to note that with the uh, board office staff so that it can be publicized widely. Thank you. Thank you, Director Blanford. Director Petu? I would like to uh, congratulate Gwendolyn Jemison also for uh, receiving the WEA Educational Support Professional of the Year. Um, well deserved. Also, uh, congratulations to Seattle University Youth Initiative for their partnership with Bailey Gastert Elementary School. And um, like Director uh, Blanford, I go by there all the time and I see a lot of kids in, within that area um, and doing some great stuff. Um, also, I would like to uh, thank John Muir's student performance tonight. Um, they did a really wonderful job blowing those uh, forgot what the, what do you call it? Recorders. Yes. Yeah. And I realize those things are really hard to play because you have to have a lot of air to actually to make music. So congratulations uh, for the wonderful work that uh, that been presented to us tonight in terms of the arts that we really believe that it's uh, a way for us to provide opportunities for a lot of our kids. Um, also, I want to say that um, my community meetings is April 29th at Rock and Tour Restaurant in Seward Park from 10 o'clock to 12 in the afternoon. And also I want to give a shout out to Clover. Clover actually um, attended a baseball game and she was telling me that she's never played baseball before. You know, right. She actually did the first strike uh, at the game when she actually uh, pitched that ball. So congratulations, uh, Clover, for actually for doing a great job. Thank you. Uh, Director Harris. 60.1 million dollars in fines at $100,000 a day for the Washington State Legislature as 
levied by the Washington State Supreme Court. That is higher than the gross national product of several small countries. And it is a stunning admission of failure. I, it blows my mind. Um, congratulations to Ms. Jimerson. She is just inspiring. And, and to see the difference that she's made in so very many different communities, it's something we can aspire to. Uh, Seattle University, in all of their programs, and, and I highlight Middle College, because they are truly partners with us in that, and they're doing a great job. The John Muir recorder kids, and I can't wait for them to come back next year with the Alto recorders as well. And, and thanks very much to the other partners that have assisted uh, the Early Music Guild and the recorder societies. Kids that do music are really good at math. And we like that, and anytime we can leverage Creative Advantage schools, that's got my vote hands down across the board. Um, thank you to our paraprofessionals and our librarians. I sometimes think that they don't get enough recognition, and this place and this district would not work without the high touch and the relationships with our paraprofessionals. And, uh, they don't get the glory and they don't get the high salaries, but they sure do get my thanks. And my next community meeting is tax day, April 15th. I understand there are still Girl Scout cookies left and we feed you. And that's 3 p.m. at the Delridge Library. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Director Burke. I want to echo my colleagues' thanks for our, our guests and for the recognitions. Um, while I don't have the same sort of history or experience with Ms. Ms. Jimerson, I, I agree that um, her depth of engagement and achievements is inspirational. Um, I have seen regularly the Seattle University uh, contributions and partnerships, and when I think of um, you know, what are the high leverage partnerships that we've got? The work that we do with Seattle University uh, is always really high on my list. So thank you again for that. Um, I always enjoy the musical presentations. Uh, the John, John Muir recorders was no, no exception to that. It's, it's amazing how, you know, we get so many different unique, whether it's music, voice, um, performing arts that, that come before us. It is a, it is a good reminder that uh, there's, a, there's just a lot of opportunities um, that are unique in each of our schools. Um, I want to put out a, a congratulations to the, uh, the Skill Center. Some of you might have seen this already. There was a, uh, a tweet and some coverage in Como last week. They did a, a demonstration session um, around their maritime operations course that's going to be starting up and uh, you know with the Seattle Maritime Academy so this is a you know great new career aligned initiative that's being done through the skills center and uh, you know they got students in attendance they got um, industrial partners in attendance and uh, really neat leverage point as well um, I had another great um, interaction with some folks at uh, one of our neighbors of the Stanford Center. If you haven't been to the Living Computer Museum, I recommend you stop by. Um, I had visited a earlier last year, or some, at some point last year, they've, um, <coughs> in my history, my past, I uh, grew up with mainframe computers doing mechanical things on computers back when you actually had to do mechanical things on computers. And so to go in there and go through their museum collection is, is like a walk down memory lane. And they've built out their ground floor with a lot of really contemporary things, um, artificial intelligence, robotics, autonomous vehicles. They're really connecting the past with the present. And I wanted to bring it here because they also have an amazing educational component. They're doing professional development for teachers. They're creating pathways to computer science. Um, and they're, they even have a movie night coming up um, it looks like tomorrow um, they're doing a uh, movie night with Hidden Figures 
And so I recommend that you take a look at their website, visit their, their place. No, uh, no money has changed hands here. I just think it's a really cool thing. So <laughs> just want to get that out there. Um, and I hope that there's a partnership opportunities where um, the school district can also leverage some of that, whether field trips or professional development. I want to touch on a couple of topics that are coming around in the Curriculum and Instruction Committee and that are, that are of, of public interest. Um, middle school math adoption, which has been a long-term, um, lo long-awaited thing. Collaboration between the board, staff, budget office. Um, we've been able to turn the process into something new, something innovative, which is let's start something even if we don't have an allocated budget. This is a case where typically when we do an adoption, we don't initiate the process until there's a, an earmarked, allocated, guaranteed budget for it. But we've had troubles with guaranteed budgets, as folks have heard. And since an adoption process typically takes a year to, t year to, to a year and a half, it means that we don't really get it off the ground. So um, we've turned that around, provided a really small amount of seed funding to allow a committee to do their work with the recognition that if we don't have the money, we don't get to adopt it until we do, but at least we'll be, um, as they say in the construction industry, shovel ready when, when we identify a funding stream, we'll be able to have some instructional materials identified by this time next year in middle school math. So that's really exciting to me. One of the other areas of work that's been um, a pretty heavy lift for the staff is an assessment policy. The um, district and the um, Seattle Education Association have already done a lot of work around this, um, building a partnership com committee to identify what, it, what assessments to our, the district is giving and putting them on a calendar and providing a, an advisory structure um, when the district is looking at changing that. And so we're trying to codify that as well in policy so that when we identify, adopt when we identify assessments, that they're targeted, that they're effective, that they're stable and that we can sustain them. Um, and that's a, that's a fairly interesting body of work. There's not a lot of districts that actually have that at the policy level. It's very common to have instructional materials at the policy level, less common to have assessments. So there's, there's some new ground being broken there and I appreciate the hard work of everybody that's doing that, you know, the partnership with SEA, the work of the staff and feedback from the board as well. And then I just want to touch on the, the ethnic studies resolution which Superintendent Nyland mentioned. Um, that's come before the Curriculum Instruction Committee a couple of times, and we have um, a draft resolution that's in process that our intent as a, as a committee was that that was going to be um, presented to the committee actually at our meeting this week. This week? This week. It's all a blur. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of time for individual directors to review it. So we postponed that for another month, and the draft of that resolution is being worked on by the board, by the staff. Um, we are committed to bringing forward a resolution, but the critical element is we don't want to create a, a promise that we can't fulfill, but we recognize that it's an important commitment. So finding that, um, that how we deliver on the vision without impacting the budget in a way that we're already um, stretching it is the, the, the work that's going on right now. Um, I want to put one, this is just a follow-up note, sort of a public service announcement. Um, again, standing on the shoulders of giants, this is celebrating the work of people over the last, probably the last five to ten years. Um, there was an item on the consent agenda using some underspend funds from our, our levies to um, to look towards energy enhancements uh, or energy reductions or some solar um, energy sources, and um, the <laughs> board received a uh, an email from one of, from our partners at Local 609. This was a, a document that was generated um, by the I believe Resource Conservation Department of Seattle Public Schools, and it was just a little big, <laughs> a big summary of the energy use index of all of our buildings. And I won't go into the details on it, but if we highlight it, talking about the, there's an Energy Star rating, an Energy Star score, that's a score of 100 maximum. National average is 50. Seattle Public Schools average EUI score of all of our buildings is 84. 
Um, so this is a tribute to the work that's being done by the capital projects team, uh, by the previous board boards with their guidance in the green resolution. And I just wanted to make sure that that was in the record and in the public eye that it's a big deal. We spend a lot of money on <coughs> energy here and we're committed to reducing that um, and that's being done at the infrastructure level. In closing, um, I'd like to say I have a meeting planned I, or booked. I don't have the date yet, but I have three of them planned. One of them will be a community meeting and then two of them will be on Lincoln High School. Um, the community meeting, I'm trying to line something up in April and then two meetings on Lincoln High School in May, one of them for students and prospective students and then the second one will be for families and I promise, promise, promise I will get some dates out and get them posted on the calendar within the next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Burke. Just have about two more minutes left. Okay. Well, I, I'll say a few things then. Um, on the ethnic studies issue, I know we'll be talking about that some more, I'm, I'm guessing. It is definitely a hot topic. I was visiting some universities in Los Angeles this past week and sure enough, there was a whole seminar about that topic at one of the universities. So it's, it's a very important issue, especially in these times. Uh, regarding the assessment policy, thank you to Director Burke for bringing that up. Uh, it would be great to hear also from the community about this. A uh, component that I would like to bring to it as well is the student and parents' rights portion of how we do assessments. In other words, making sure that we let students and parents know about what assessments are being um, administered and getting results to them in a timely manner so they understand the purpose and the value of these and so you know everybody's on board and also to keep an eye on how much time we're spending on assessing our students at in you know and balance that out with how much time we're spending in, you know instructing our students um, let's see a couple of uh, housekeeping items there's going to be a boundary changes meeting at uh, John Hay Elementary on this Thursday tomorrow I believe it is at six o'clock and that has to do with the, um, the magno opening of Magnolia Elementary. And so there's going to be a number of community meetings <coughs> for the various uh, communities on the Queen Anne and Magnolia neighborhoods so we can move forward on some plans that, that uh, are the least disruptive for our students. And then as far as my own community meeting, um, I'm planning to have something after the spring break. Uh, I will also post that soon. It's likely to be at a cafe. Uh, libraries are getting harder to book. And um, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully around the 21st or so is when I'll have my meeting. But in the meantime, I am definitely working on uh, uh, attending uh, some PTA meetings at some of the, some schools, and that's always an option uh, in terms of, of meeting with directors. So um, I guess I'll leave it at that because we are now at 5:30, which is our public testimony part of the evening. And before we begin tonight. Please note that there are handouts on the back table regarding option schools and ethnic studies. And now as far as the rules, uh, the rules for public testimony are on the screen and I would ask that speakers be respectful of these rules. I would note that the board does not take public comments on items related to personnel or individually named staff. I would also like to note that each speaker has a two minute speaking time. When the two minutes have ended, please conclude your remarks. Ms. Ritchie. Uh, will, or actually we have a, okay, Ms. Ritchie will read off the names of our testimony speakers. Thank you. Michaela Carlos and Devin Harris. After them is Yasna Vismel Male and Scott Conch. Any of those speakers here? Okay. Honey Ahmed. Oh, you are? Okay. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm here to express my opposition to increased enrollment at option schools. This is decision represents the worst in district planning. You have a false choice communicated at the last minute with zero parental involvement for a decision that has effectively already been made. I, I can't tell you how frustrating, frustrating this is. The plan makes no sense for the school that my daughter attends, Salmon Bay K-8. 
If a 20, 1 to 22 ratio makes sense for a neighborhood school, then why does it not make sense for option schools? I understand there are some unique situations for higher class sizes, like language immersion schools, but this will be a huge disruption to our school and several other option schools that I'm aware of. I want to add that the community at my school has been tirelessly advocating for public education and McCleary funding for many years. We've attended town hall meetings, sent letters and emails, hosted meetings with legislators at our library, and driven to Olympia annually to make our case on Focus Day. The biggest issue for which we've advocated is reduced class sizes for everyone in this state. How do you think those families feel now? Please adjust the plan so that option schools are enrolled the same as attendance area schools. Perhaps a waiver application policy could be implemented to address the needs of those few schools that could benefit from higher enrollment. I would ask that you reach out to option schools and see just how many of them want to have lower class sizes. I'll bet you'll see that the majority will prefer that. And ask parents. Um, our, our, our school in particular, we have wait lists at every grade. And uh, the description that you gave earlier is, uh, doesn't apply to our school. So I, I hope you reach out and get more information on this. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Honey Ahmed, Gustavo Brerho, and Gon Rosario. Are you here today? I don't see him. Yeah, Gustavo? Do I just go? All right. I stand here today to present a proposition made by the NAACP to implement an ethnic studies class in the Seattle School District and abroad. Back in late January, the Seattle Times printed an article explaining that the NAACP wants Seattle schools to integrate ethnic studies into classes at every school in hopes that the ethnic studies class will eventually become a graduation requirement. Initially, the NAACP asked for a proposition to be made to implement an ethnic studies curriculum into the incorporated in, and be incorporated into existing courses. With that said, the objective of the NAACP, according to Rita Green, the Seattle King County NAACP Education Chair, is to have an ethnic studies class separate from other classes to be implemented by fall of 2020. According to the same article, if Seattle Public Schools accepts the NAACP's proposal, Seattle would join a large growing number of districts, as you guys have mentioned earlier, that have been developing ethnic studies curricula, such as Portland and LA school districts. The state of California right now is currently on board to incorporating a required ethnic studies curriculum by the fall of 2019, putting them ahead of the state of Washington. According to a study done by scholars at the Stanford Graduate School for Education, a high school ethnic studies course remaining, examining the roles of race, nationality, culture, and identity and experience boosted the attendance and academic performance of students at risk of dropping out. And some of these examples um, that these ethnic studies courses would do is um, make, it, in some cases it helps improve the GPA of some students by increased by one point four grade points and have full credits earned. Um, I'm gonna skip part of it and just go to the end. At my high school, sorry, I did a survey where I went around during lunch asking students what they thought about ethnic studies class. Over 50 students that I interviewed, only two of them said that they didn't think it was a good idea. And the reason why they told me wasn't, um, was simply that they felt that implementing ethnic studies as a separate class would interfere with possible elective options and create frustration among students needing to take into account that they would now need more high school credits to graduate. And please continue your remarks. Yeah. Okay. Oh well. You can send us your comments if you like. All right. Send them to the board. Thank you. I, I'm sorry. This That's was That's okay. Two that. minutes is not very long. Thank you very much. Honey, Ami, did you walk in? Okay, I thought so. Gian, you're after her. Good 
Good evening, school board members. My name is Honey Ahmed, and I'm a junior at Rainier Beach High School, and I'm can part of the- Can you speak a little bit closer to the mic so we oh, can Oh, sorry. Hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, school board members. Perfect. My name is Hani Ahmed, and I'm a junior at Rainier Beach High School, taking the full IB program. I'm here to speak about the Rainier Beach High School's IB program. The IB program has been successful since its initial launch in 2013. In 2012, our graduation rate stood at 59.6%, but after the IB program was implemented, the graduation rate increased by 21.9%. In 2015, the graduation rate was 81.5%, which is well over the Seattle School District's average 76.7%. It has also increased our pop school student population from 404 students in 2012 to 671 in 2015. And all these, all these statistics are from the OSPI website. It is a shame that the Seattle School Board is not funding the IB program. The IB program is once again at risk because the grants that are funding IB program, the IB are set to expire the following year. If the school board doesn't fund the IB program at Rainier Beach High School, it will strain the finite resources that the Rainier Beach High School receives. This may not be the best time to demand funding to go into IB with the $50 million shortfall, but in the future, hopefully as soon as early next year, this school board would commit to fully fund the IB program. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Gian Rosario. Um, good evening, school board members. My name is Gian Rosario, and I will be speaking about Rainier Beach High School's dire need for uh, renovation. Um, so the paper that I gave you was from the um, SBS website. It was a main report from August 1st, 2014. Um, that will be highlighting some of the deficiencies of Rainier Beach High School based off of this report. So um, some of the deficiencies starts with, um, but are not limited to, uh, the elevator was installed in 1961. It is past its expected lifespan and is not ADA compliant. V VAT and carpet are original and poor in, are in, and in poor condition. Some VAT and carpet have lifted and seams are opening up. Door hardware at many room is not ADA compliant. Original windows are not energy efficient. Original panels are past their useful life. Original branch wiring and devices are past their useful life. The, the little theater dimmer board is past its useful life. The exterior windows are original single pane metal system. They are not energy efficient. Um, the linoleum flooring is original and is in poor condition. It has delimited, is worn, scuffed, and seams have opened. Service panel is past its useful life and the building is heated by two gas-fired gas -fired steam boilers installed in 1961. Um, the south walkway along east side of the building is deteriorated and should be concrete. Timbers are rotted and falling apart along planters at main entry building, and most importantly, there are no fire sprinklers in the main building except the auditorium. Um, in 2013, Rainier Beach High School students staged the walkout and I hope this time our school board, school board members will take action. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next three speakers are Miriam Abraham, Sokina Keo, and Chris Jackins. Hello, my name is Mariama Ibrahim. Um, I'm a student at Rainier Beach High School, and today I'm going to be talking about how the budget cut is going to impact our school. Um, so basically, I feel like if you got since like you guys are doing a whole big budget cut, I feel like it's going to be impacting a lot of students because like a lot of grants help um, many students because like a lot of like many students deal with all types of stuff, 
and the counselors and a lot of programs help the students to connect with them and stuff. And like all these grants that came to our school helped a lot of students have hope to go to college and like have a dream and stuff. So I feel like you guys should rethink and like not cut a lot of money from my school because we're already going through a lot. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening, school board members. My name is Sokina Q, and I'm a senior at Rainier Beach High School. As for the renovation, we need to stay on the Bex V and be on top of that list. How inadequitable inadequ is it that to use a rating system to prevent a full renovation of our school? You built a completely new building for South Lake, an alternative school for students who are behind in credits. Are we not worth that? We are located across the water and can't help but think that the private interests are trying to close our school down for monetary interests. Please hear me out. Rainier Beach High School direly needs this renovation. It is equally as such that our IB is just as valuable. We need them both. We will fight for this and other resources that would help me and other students at Rainier Beach High School receive a quality and equitable education. We need the school board and the powers that be to fund the IB program at Rainier Beach High School as it will strain the finite resources that Rainier Beach High School receives. This may not be the best time to demand funding to go into the IB with the $50 million shortfall. But in the future, hopefully as soon as next year, this school board needs to commit to fully fund the IB program at Rainier Beach High School and the other two IB schools as well. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Chris Jackins, Box 84063, Seattle 98124. On the Magnolia Construction Project, seven points. Number one, the district must certify that the project will not create or aggravate racial imbalance. Number two, on February 1st, district staff asked the board to approve a resolution on Magnolia toward obtaining such certification, called the D5 form. Number three, I asked the board to not approve the resolution because the resolution did not seem to comply with state law. Number four, by a vote of seven to zero, the board nevertheless approved the resolution. Number five, I wrote to the state attorney general and the superintendent of public instruction, OSPI. Number six, the attorney general's office stated, quote, before it approves the D5 form, OSPI is asking Seattle Public Schools to address the concerns you identified in your letter. Unquote. Number seven, I continue to have questions about the adequacy of board and district oversight. On the elementary school feeder grant, the board report references gap closing successes, but the report does not reference any statistics on gaps. On the budget transfer of BX2, BX3 underspend for implementation of an energy efficiency project. BEX2 had to borrow from other levies. How can BEX2 have had an underspend? On school board elections, I favor having lots of candidates run for school board to get a public discussion of issues. Three positions were up for election this year, number four, number five, and number seven. The candidate filing period is May 15th to May 19th. Thank you. Thank you. The next three speakers are Eliza Rankin, Katherine Lehrman, and Zing Yang Gilbert. Hi. Uh, I have a sick kid at home, so my thoughts are not super well composed. But um, uh, I'm signed up today uh, in support of ethnic studies. And um, I think supporting ethnic studies is something that is pretty, s something that we can pretty simply all agree on. I don't think it's a hard sell to say, yes, we need ethnic studies. So um, th when that part is behind us, the, par the hard part is, what does that look like? How is it implemented? And the key piece for me is who's accountable for it, and making sure that it's not just the check mark on the resolution, that it's actually something that actually happens. Um, 
I also, going beyond that, as important it is, as it is for students to learn their own histories and hear each other's stories, we also need to reflect that out to the adults. Um, we need a district full of adults who see and hear these stories, value these students, and um, students and educators that learn and understand their role in the dominant culture and how they can if they're part of the dominant culture, how they can work on dismantling um, barriers that keep us from achieving equity in our district. Uh, I see a lot of ed uh, educators doing this work already. There are equity teams and people working in teams and buildings. Students are engaged and there's message coming from above. But the part that's missing is the part in between. And that's where I think a lot of accountability gets lost um, with other uh, issues and that's the part that I want us really to focus on is that we need cultural competency at all levels we need um, building leaders and uh, administrators between here and the buildings that understand how cultural competency or lack thereof affects discipline curriculum school culture as a whole how kids feel when they're at school their sense of community and whether or not every child is honored and accepted as a full member of that school um, Ah. So what I hope that we can take the Ethnic Studies Resolution as a tiny, tiny piece in a much bigger picture of making sure that we're creating school communities where all students are valued, have pathways to success, not in spite of who they are, but because of who they are. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Reedy Learman. I'm a parent and vice chair of the site council at Thornton Creek Elementary, which, as you know, is an option school, and option schools are slated to be enrolled at higher class sizes than all attendance area schools for the 2017 2018 year. So, I want to reiterate what the first speaker said that this is inequitable and unjust. If 22 to 1 is good enough for attendance area schools, why is it not good enough for option schools? The decision making process through which this decision was made was clandestine, did not include any input from the families directly impacted. And this represents another example of the district breeding ill will from the community against them. So if the district truly wants to have the parent community as collaborators, we need to have input on decisions that affect our children. We apparently have no choice but to move forward with this reality, and so concessions were thrown to us as flexible staffing. Um, in the form of additional flexible staffing. And while this will help mitigate the challenges of increased class sizes, we need safeguards and guarantees in place that this funding isn't going to be pulled out from under us next year. We don't need a one-time funding. We need this funding to track the cohorts of increased class sizes as they matriculate through all of elementary school, because enrolling K at 26 to 1 is a six-year commitment at best. Our third point is we remain hopeful that the McCleary will be funded in the near future. And when this happens, we fully expect to be enrolled in line with McCleary. And does the district have any plan in place to go from 26 down to 17? Because attrition alone is not going to get us there. So we would like to encourage and participate in a plan for getting our option schools from this increased class size down um, as soon as possible. Our fourth point is that we're hearing from the district that option school demand is high. And that is part of the reason why we're being enrolled at higher class sizes. And if that's so, then why would we not replicate the system rather than deprecate it? By diluting the success rate by increasing class sizes at option schools, that's not a solution. Instead of increasing class sizes at some of the most successful schools, why don't we replicate the programs elsewhere? Thank you very much. Thank you. Sing Yang. After Zing Yang is Marianne Wagner and Alexandra Storm. Um, uh, okay. Um, hi, my name's Xing. Um, I'm a junior at Roosevelt, and this is why ethnic studies matter to me. Uh, as things are, history classes at Roosevelt and in much of the US are told from a white narrative. All four of my AP textbooks are authored by white men. Um, you might ask, is this narrative by white men alone uh, adequate. My peers and I have come to understand that it isn't. Um, my teachers at Roosevelt have made 
every effort to bring historical figures of color into our radar. But what is deeply discouraging to me is that the curriculum itself does not allow for them to do this sufficiently. Um, it is riddled with holes that undervalue and isolate students of color. Our core textbook has single paragraphs sprinkled throughout titled African Americans, Native Americans, Latinos, whereas the bulk of the text holds white men as if they were the standard, as if single paragraphs were enough to express the ideologies, the oppression, and the successes of entire ethnic groups. This is the essence of white privilege, when the history of colored peoples is not woven into the history of America, but forcibly removed and taught as an afterthought. It is not just in my eyes um, to require students of color to sit with their white peers learning Eurocentric history and then not entrust knowledge to both of them about the histories of colored peoples. For this reason, it is critical that Seattle schools protect the time for ethnic studies in the classroom. I believe that filling the academic gap will engender mutual respect among communities and individuals, and I know that it will strengthen all of my peers regardless of their ethnicity. I am both Caucasian and Asian. As a white woman, I know that much of the censorship in our modern textbooks is for my comfort, and that by learning the history that may make me uncomfortable, I can better understand the inequalities that permeate our society. As an Asian woman, I would like to learn history and read literature that both represents and empowers me, my peers, and my sister. Thank you. Thank you. We have yeah. some documents for, oh. for you. I'm Marion Wagner, and I'm a fourth grade teacher at Salmon Bay School, I'm a national board certified teacher, and I'm on the Seattle Education Association Board of Directors. I'm here today to bring the voice of stakeholders uh, that were not heard in the recent decision regarding enrolling only in option schools at high class sizes. I share Dr. Nyland and the board's values of openness, fairness, transparency, um, to find our, the best solutions for our schools. These values are the basis of trust. In this decision, however, stakeholders were not heard. Princi principals were told. Staff, Seattle Education Association, and parents have just found out about this. The staff of Salmon Bay School, as you see in the letter there, have written to express our opposition to the district's blanket plan for higher kindergarten through fifth grade class sizes at all option schools. Salmon Bay, we're adamant we do not want larger class sizes K through five. We want class sizes that are commensurate with neighborhood schools. We understand some option schools want larger kindergarten cohorts to mitigate attrition. We experience very little attrition in our school and never have trouble filling seats in upper elementary when there are seats available. Not all option schools have the same needs. By forcing a solution on our school when we don't have a problem is creating a problem. If the school district would like us to create more classrooms to manage capacity demands, then build those. Open more option schools if that's what parents are clamoring for. But don't structurally start with high class sizes at all of those schools because 1.2 teachers per class, the offered solution, with 26 students doesn't equate to one teacher with 22 students. We expect you to listen to this reasonable request and enroll option schools with the same class sizes as neighborhood schools unless they specifically request otherwise. To not honor this, it appears we're being systematically undermined and ignored as to what we have expressed we need. This is the only equitable solution for students and educators. Thank you. Thank you. Alexandria Storm. Okay. Shannon Crowley, Susan Stahl, and Daniela Hall. Good evening, my name is Shannon Crowley. I am an intermediate teacher at Stanislao Elementary School in West Seattle. And according to a Seattle Times article this past summer, it is the most diverse school in the state of Washington. And that's what brings me here this evening as you consider your position on ethnic studies in the Seattle public schools. Several years ago when there was a, a rush to adopt the Common Core State Standards, I was interested and I looked up in the Common Core what the standards were for social studies in the grade that I teach and I was alarmed that there are none. 
According to the Common Core, social studies is taught grades 6 through 12. And ever since then, when I've heard the phrase career and college ready, it's been like the sound of fingernails on a chalkboard to me because don't we want our students to be college, career, and civically ready? And that starts with social studies and ethnic studies. According to the curriculum standards in this book, which was written the first time about 20 years ago, students um, in the early grades should be able to learn about students around the world and how they learn and grow. This is, the national, this is from the National Council of Social Studies. And furthermore, the research shows, as some other people have mentioned, that when students are immersed in histories that reflect their own cultures, they succeed. They do better in schools. And we need to empower our students of color with histories that include their kings, their queens, their philosophers, their teachers, their doctors, everyone that is important to them that can make them see who they can be in the future. And if a kindergartner can say to another kindergartner on the playground, why is it that you wear a hijab? Not only are our elementary school students ready for ethnic studies, but they are primed with curiosity. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Suze. And I'm here to talk to you about the potential and urgency for a mandatory, robust ethnic studies program to counteract negative messages that our students are internalizing every day in our classrooms. I've been teaching in SPS for 10 years, and I'm now an instructional coach and a teaching assistant in the University of Washington's secondary teacher education program. Yesterday, I observed in a school that houses a highly capable cohort, or HCC. Most, most students in the HCC classes were white, in contrast to the gen ed classes. A teacher told me that her students regularly, regularly refer to gen ed as the dummy classes, and HCC students as the smart kids. Over the years, I've heard similar comments at the mostly white high school where I teach inclusion, also disproportionately populated by students of color, while AP classes rarely have even one student of color. In this de facto within school seg segregation system, white students are internalizing messages of superiority, and students of color are internalizing messages of inferiority. With thoughtful implementation, ethnic studies could help to disrupt this insidious pattern. According to the SPS website, there are currently seven full-time staff members devoted to advanced learning, while there are only four in the Department of Equity and Race Relations. This reinforces the superiority slash inferior inferiority messaging I just described. Perhaps most upsetting, this situation is not new. Staffing formulas like this, along with inequitable discipline, curriculum, and pedagogical decisions and practices have been giving disproportionate advantages to white privileged students for decades. <coughs> Sorry, I'm skipping down. Bureaucracy continues to hinder the growth and development of our most vulnerable students. Students who have the most to offer our educational system in terms of leadership, cultural flexibility, and justed oriented scholarship. Please move swiftly to develop and implement ethnic studies in our high schools. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Daniela Hall, and I am a parent in the district. I'm also a teacher at a private school for middle school kids in social studies. Interestingly enough, I'm finding this conversation very interesting. And um, I am also the secretary of the special education PTSA, and I also am a SEAC member, um, Special Education Education and Advocacy Council, and I've been involved with SEAC for quite some time now. <clears throat> so I'm here tonight to just share with you some of the things that have been going on with special ed to inform you about the great work that we've been doing. I am part of a handful of parent volunteers that have been working really hard in the last year to create a much more collaborative, uh, working in the spirit of collaboration. Our kids are primarily in the younger grades, so all of us are relatively new to special ed and new to the district. But I just want to share, you, share with you some of the stuff that we've been doing. And the reason I'm here tonight is because since I'm both um, part of the PTSA board and I'm on SEAC, I report back and forth, so I listen to parent concerns 
concerns at PTA, I bring them to SEAC, and then I report about what SEAC is doing to the PTA. So um, one of the things that we've been working on for the last year and a half in SEAC, I don't know if you have all have seen the Change of Schools Guide. I can leave my one copy with you, but um, this was developed, we have a four-page a uh, change of schools guide for parent and a no parents and a nine-page guide for teachers that we developed through SEAC with a tremendous amount of community input. The change of schools process has been extremely challenging for special ed families over the years and we feel like um, working with the district we're making some great strides. Also to put on your radar that school tour dates have been very challenging and we are very encouraged that there's recognition in buildings and the district that the tour dates need to be moved earlier and need to be advertised more widely so that our special ed families can be informed and be able to make... Really? Is that two minutes? Dang it. Okay. Um, sorry. Two last things really quickly. Um, inclusion culture in buildings is different from building to building, and it's really important that we have some standards and look at what's happening that's working well in buildings for treating our special ed students and families like first class please, instead please of second class remarks. citizens. What's that? I'm sorry. I have to ask you to con con conclude your okay, remarks. Okay. That's it. And I have one more thing. And put on your radar also that with HCC, they need continuum services and right now they're mutually exclusive, but get ready, I'm an HCC teacher in a private school. You're getting more kids that are going to need more accommodations, and you just need to be forward-thinking about thank it. You. And I'll be back, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Rebecca Brito, Craig C. Scholes, and Melissa Taylor. Rebecca? Okay. Craig, you're up. Hi, I'm Craig Seashells. I gave this to 100 uh, learning leaders yesterday. And I have to say, I appreciated walking in tonight to hear complimentary remarks. This is School Library Month, and um, I appreciate every board director that gets into a school library this month to be seen. Dr. Nyland, it was disappointing yesterday when I read, we do need to continue investing in our libraries. And I asked the 100 leaders, who remembers that letter from June 7th last year? And six of the 100 stood up at a budget time of year. Now, I know it's a long meeting and they have to sit a long time, but I was hoping for a few more people to recall that they want to keep in mind equitable funding for library materials. I also hope that as the budget uh, replacement and the, and the levy cliff refunding happens, that the positions that we lose um, to librarians, some of the librarians that are half-time in our schools, the other half is made up of PCP. If they lose those positions, that school loses computer technology education going forward because the gold book, the WSS, has not addressed that. That's an explicit loss to the school. And we don't want that to happen. We want full-time librarians in every Seattle public school. We want equitable funding. Of course, we want it from Olympia, but we want it sooner than that. Okay, so I appreciate that. I want to mention and remind people that Portland Board and then PTA addressed that issue with the 33% over $10,000 that the PTA raises goes to an equity fund that goes to all schools. That's stopgap, but that's Seattle, and that came from the school board in Portland. So I thank you all. You know, I, I gave you plenty to read and link, and I look forward to seeing you in our libraries. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa Taylor, uh, parent of a second grader. Uh, the topic of ethnic studies is so critically important right now. Um, it reflects the nexus of a number of my current experiences. As a parent, I am struggling to explain the full context of police brutality, deportations, and domestic terrorism to my eight-year-old. As an admin in a very unwieldy Facebook group of about 26,000 mostly Washington, white Washington activists, we spent a lot of time educating fellow adults about racism and a lot of these basic concepts and history. As a co-chair of a social justice committee studying the detention of youth in our community, I was told by a judge that they don't control who shows up in their court where the reality is that children of color are far more likely to show up there and be detained essentially advising me to look upstream. And our school system and our school discipline systems are part of that upstream impact. 
And with all of this context, I have to tell you that ethnic studies feels as relevant and perhaps even more relevant than all of the other subjects my daughter and her peers study. I realize funding is a challenge, to put it mildly. Um, I have been to Olympia three times in the last three weeks advocating for more funding. I know it's a problem, and that being said, spending reflects our priorities. And I think it is critical that we <coughs> prioritize dismantling racism as an urgent issue for our community. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, our last three speakers tonight, Chris Ledford, Maria Angiano, and Amon Wilderfil. Chris? Amon? Good afternoon to y'all here today. My name is Amon Wilderfield. I'm a student, I'm a, I'm a sec secretary at Garfield High School's Black Student Union, and I will be speaking on behalf of the BSU. Marcus, I'll be speaking for in support of uh, ethnic studies. Marcus Garvey once said, a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. All of our lives in school, we have been taught a, a, a completely whitewashed history. We have been taught that the greatest contributors to the world were white. We have been taught that the first people to discover this country that we live in were white. We have been taught a history where white people are glorified over everyone else. We have been taught so many lies and subliminally this perpetuates the idea of white supremacy. This totally disregards the greatness of original people all around the earth and strips the roots from human life. This ill idea of white supremacy is the reason why there is an intentional misrepresent misrepresentation of history in the education system. It is in fact a power tactic. Why would you want to deny a people of their true history? Ethnic studies classes are paramount to building up the self-confidence of original people who are poorly represented throughout the history that is taught in the system to the youth. Ethnic studies classes gives knowledge of how much worth work other ethnicities have put in for this world that we live in today. It is absolutely important that you all implement these classes as mandatory and give teachers the proper funding for training and equipment. The city has no problem um, creating a new youth jail and giving money for that, but they cannot fund an education to keep youth out of those jails. Ethnic studies can, in fact, help to keep kids out of jail by showing them that they, uh, in fact, do have a strong and powerful history and that they themselves are a great people and can accomplish great things. Thank you. Thank you. Our South Lake student has arrived, so if Michaela Carlos can come up and then we're done. Hi. Um, I'm not really prepared for this, but I'm, I was told that I'm here to speak on behalf of South Lake, and I think everybody has been talking about ethnic studies and I don't think that's something that has to be worried about at South Lake because sorry I'm really nervous but with the very small school we have a very strong support system and the staff makes sure that it's making sure that everybody feels included and they feel that and I feel that um, everybody's history is respected because not only in the past month we have had a speaker who came with a traveling museum with a traveling museum on the history of Africans and African culture we also had um, we also had um, oh my god I forgot her no her name but a woman she came in Erin Jones there she came and she spoke to us and I think that everyone um, really appreciated it we have also our career specialist has also made it 
um, a priority that we have a guest speaker every week who comes and I feel that everybody has a very tight um, support, very, is very supported in the school and I just want to say oh, sorry, thank you for the funding and it's not I know that everybody at South Lake is working on rebranding because when you think of South Lake students you think oh they're bad but they're not they just need people who care and that's what we have thank, thank you, you. thank you Rebecca Brito Hi, my name is Rebecca Brito and I'm a parent in Northeast Seattle. Um, this summer I participated in the Cedar Park Race and Equity Analysis Team. During the conversations, district staff said over and over again, um, we're hesitant to open another option school and we're concerned about the demographic shifts that took place in West Seattle. This was reiterated to us over and over again, but we didn't have the data in front of us. And um, I continued advocating for an option school to avoid segregation across Northeast Seattle, just in case you forgot. <laughs> so um, after that decision was made, I had time and I went through and I copied demographic information from the OSPI website and I saw what they were talking about in West Seattle. There's a huge shift in demographics that took place in about five years um, where uh, I only know the term white flight for what took place where you have an isolation of Caucasian families in one area and interestingly also African American uh, students were congregated in certain schools and additionally Latino families were separated into different schools so that's a huge demographic shift that takes place um, when we bring about option schools choice is not equitable it's not available to everybody. We've had this conversation more than once. The lack of transportation service is not equitable and it means that people don't have the access that they need. In North Seattle, the demographic shifts not, might not be as obvious, but now at the other side of that decision, we have a challenge um, at places like John Rogers with the concerns about will we have um, engaged and active parents in the next few years. Um, I bring this point up tonight um, in the conversations about the weighted staffing standards and um, class sizes and option schools because there is a resistance to accept higher class sizes at option schools and I think that is because there's not enough explanation for the demographics um, and those shifts. Please so conclude your remarks. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that concludes our public testimony for this evening. Thank you all very much for coming. We always appreciate hearing from the community. So I will now um, return to my colleagues on the board and see if anybody would like to either add or, or begin their comments. Director Geary, thank you. Thank you to everybody who came tonight, as always. Um, in my year and a half that, or not quite year and a half, year and a quarter, I guess, that I've been on the board, um, it is really nice to see that we've seen a continually growing number of students coming and testifying um, before us. And I think that that is wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you for taking the time to be engaged. Uh, I appreciate it and will always appreciate your presence. Um, and it's hard because we want to give you everything you ask for, but as you know, we, um, we're always balancing a lot of different things. So, but I just want you to know it doesn't fall on deaf ears. Is there something? Okay. Um, thank you, Gwendolyn Jimerson, uh, for coming or for uh, all of your dedication and um, being the Educational Support Professional of the Year. Uh, I did hear that you were interested in one day being on the school board. Um, certainly, our school district could use many, many people that would bring your dedication. Um, and energy to all the different work that needs to be done. Thank you to the school paraprofessionals and librarians. I know from watching my own kids how important the school librarian can be. 
um, and the paraprofessionals and all the support that they give to a school, they, they make it run. Um, they allow the teachers the time to, to do their work. And without them, it doesn't run smoothly. And I recognize that. And we all need to thank them. And I know we appreciate them. And the budget cuts don't always reflect how important they are. And so we do need to work to make sure that we are providing those critical services to our schools. Thank you to the John Muir Music Program um, and coming and showing us what the Creative Advantage Program can do. And I want to thank that program in particular for its inclusivity and finding a place for everybody within that program. Um, and you could see the joy of all of the different members of that group in their performance before us. And I think that is just a lovely picture of all kinds of different kids coming together in an activity. And uh, anybody who thinks that a, any type of extracurricular activity shouldn't include everybody and doesn't have a place for everybody only needs to visit the John Muir Music Program to see that that isn't true. Thank you to all of our community partners, Seattle University Youth Initiative, the Satterberg Foundation, Rotary, Seattle College. There's so many partners out there, everyone playing an important part in our district. And so thank you to them all. Um, until we are fully funded, clearly we, are, we need you. Um, and it makes me think of the fact that on the one hand, there are people who are saying that we as a district need to be more centrally focused and then it's against the pressure of, of all the work that we have to do in the individual schools. And our partners bring that individuality to all our schools that we as a district have to continue to make sure that we're open to receive. And so that is a very, it's a tough tension. And I, I, you hear people make the arguments on both sides of it. And yet when I see these partners, I realize that we need to continue to welcome them in our school. And that takes a certain amount of flexibility and willingness on our part to recognize they bring unique um, gifts to our unique communities. And I want to thank, uh, thanks um, to all the parents who are traveling down to Olympia on a regular basis to testify on behalf of our schools, whether it be for ethnic studies, whether it be funding for CTE. You are, too, some of our important partners. So thank you so much for taking that time. It, um, it's a lot of effort to go for just a few minutes in front of people who sometimes feel like a very hostile audience to our cause. But it's necessary that we show up, and I know um, that it's not easy making that trip. So I particularly appreciate it. Um, since our last board meeting, I've had a chance to visit a few schools. Uh, visited Wedgwood Elementary today with my colleague, Rick Burke, um, and had the pleasure of spending some time in that community. Um, also visited Nathan Hale and uh, sat with their principal, Jill Hudson to learn about the project-based learning and mentoring that's going on in that school. It is a wonderful example of a very inclusive community that is working diligently to recognize and appreciate every single type of student in their community. Everybody is an individual at Nathan Hale, and it was just a pleasure to go visit. I've had the chance to go on two field trips, one with Ballard High School, the oceanography class, to uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and one with Laurelhurst Elementary fourth graders to visit the Great Migration Series at uh, Seattle Art Museum by the series by Jacob Lawrence. And I hope that we, I know I have heard repeatedly that our field trips um, have become very difficult. The paperwork is burdensome. So first I want to thank any of the teachers who are willing to go through the steps necessary and the parents who are going to fill out the bevy of paperwork that goes along with it. And I, I recognize fundamentally that these are educational experiences that our kids love and get so much out of and reinforce the learning that they're doing in the classroom. And I just wonder how equitably we're making that available and what we as a district staff can do to help the schools that are having difficulty with the high burden of field trips to make sure that, that their student populations have them available as well, because they're such a wonderful resource for our kids. Um, my community meetings, I have met with people from the Magnolia Queen Anne area and the Thornton Creek parent population. Thank you, as always, for your willingness to participate and come and talk to us. 
Um, I hope that we're getting the message out that we too would love small class sizes. Of course, we want small class sizes for our kids. We need to make sure that we are um, enrolling our students in all of our schools in an equitable fashion so that every child has the best ratios possible that we can afford for them. Um, and to the extent that there was any miscommunication about the option schools uh, taking on that burden unduly, um, I, I hope that that gets clarified soon and that that doesn't actually come to pass on the ground because I don't think that was anybody's <laughs> intent. And my last thing about the special education issues, I, I want to make it clear to everybody that special education is merely a tool to get kids to the basic floor of educational opportunity that we provide. And that if we as a district are going to define the basic floor of educational opportunity to include something greater than, than just standards. So if we're going to offer smaller class sizes, if we're going to offer um, more enrichment, if we're going to offer more relationship building services, if we're going to offer these things to our students, that we need to make sure that it is understood that that is the basic floor of educational opportunity for Seattle Public Schools. And that special education is just a service to make sure that every student has access to that basic floor of educational opportunity. And that the floor of opportunity for our special education families is not different than the floor that we're offering to every other student. And so I will continue to make sure that that is what we are doing here. Um, and I need to hear from anybody out there who believes that that's something different than what we are doing because I will take that upon myself to continue to work on that particular issue um, as we roll forward. So uh, my meeting, uh, I'm working to schedule it on April 22nd. I don't have a place locked down. I've been trying to use that library scheduling service, but for some reason it will never confirm what I've asked for. So I'm working on it and I'll let you know the place. And then I'm gonna continue to do my Thursday morning coffees. Um, and I will hold the one tomorrow at Zoka on Blakely at 7.30 a.m. and continue if you want to participate on the, on the weeks that I don't announce here, you may go on my Facebook site and I will indicate whether or not I am going or not because sometimes um, there are things that prevent me from showing up. But I will be there tomorrow if anybody wants to come and sit down with me. Be happy to do that. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to add any comments? Director Pinkup? I do want to go back and uh, congratulate and, uh, Gwendolyn Jimerson uh, for she will be a valuable asset to uh, not only <coughs> uh, Seattle but uh, across the state. And also thank you to Seattle University with their uh, youth initiative. Uh, good to see that what they're able to engage uh, with students and let them know that it is possible for them to achieve what they want to achieve. Uh, yeah, the only <coughs> thing they have to do is really believe in themselves and I think having that mentor provides them that motivation. Uh, and I want to recognize again all the librarians uh, for their commitment to you and that, yeah, so uh, what can we do to make sure that each of our schools has a full-time librarian you know, for someone to have a half-time or something less, it, again, doesn't seem very equitable for our, our schools and our students all around. Thank you to John Muir and their presentation uh, with the recorders. Uh, it's one of the instruments I never was able to play, but I'm not very musically inclined, so very impressed that uh, elementary students uh, are able to make that achievement and for their instructors to you know, carry them on to, to learn these musics. And uh, again, uh, it's just something I was never able to do, so I'm very impressed. Uh, and as far as the ethnic studies and what's going on, the, the students are asking for this. And this is needed because when we look around schools and what students need to feel is accepted at a school, feel like they belong at the school, and that they have a sense of community at the school. And that's something that I feel that, see, that ethnic studies can provide because we are a very diverse uh, community here in the city of Seattle. So we need to accept 
all the students that are there, not for what we want them to be, but for who they are. And we need to make sure that they belong, they feel like they belong at the school when they can look around and see, oh, I'm represented either some fashion or form in the school buildings that they're at that we send our kids to. They need to be able to look around and see themselves. And I get the feeling that they feel that, hey, I can see myself, I'm represented in this school. They then accept some responsibility themselves to make sure that they will attend school and do well in school. You make them feel like they belong and I think we'll see a, a fantastic return. And last, that community, you know, that we do need to make sure that those students are supported. Oftentimes students from community, uh, places where maybe they don't have that support at home, they need to build that community at the school. Uh, for me at the college, university, we do have to see about how we provide that community. Sometimes students bring that community with them, sometimes they have to let it go, and we need to be able to help them either reestablish that community, make a new community for them, but they need to know that there's people around them that believe in them, support them, and that will carry them through. And I truly feel that ethnic studies is one way to do that, and also the civics. You know, so people are aware that my actions impact others, and how I see others also impacts myself and how I interact, and uh, that cultural competency that some of our speakers talked about. And it's not only that, but also cultural responsiveness, uh, what they do when they see people that may not difference in a bad way, but they're different. They view <coughs> things differently, have different perspectives. Uh, because it really reminded me, uh, you know, when I look at what happened with the natives in boarding schools experience, where their mission was to kill the Indian and save the man. And our students now are saying, hey, I'm not being taught who I am, where I come from. And if we're missing that in our schools, then let's see what we can do to make sure that students, again, we accept them for who they are, not for who we want them to be. Um, and I'll close right now just as far as, as we look at things, you know, student involvement versus student engagement. Students are showing that they want to be involved in their education. And now it's up to us to engage them in that. Katia Ayala, thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to add any remarks? Okay. I have a, a few that I'll add. Um, you know, when we talk about ethnic studies, you know, I'm thinking back to my years in school, and I think we've always had a problem with inadequate textbooks. And my best teachers were the ones who always suppl supplemented what, what the basic textbook provided. And so um, I think it's been a challenge for a long time. And whatever we decide to do needs to be very thoughtful. And I'd like us to not have to reinvent the wheel and not have to just supplement, but develop something where um, we have solid materials from the get-go. That might even, be, even begin with a reading list. The other thing that occurred to me was, listening to everybody tonight, was what I'm hearing really is what we need to do as a district and as a nation is tell the whole story. And we just haven't been doing that. We've just been telling part of it. And so if we could do that, and if we did it right, we might not even need a specific ethnic studies class because it would be part of everything we do. It should be in our literary studies. It should be in our history. It should be in our civics. We should know everybody's stories. So I, again, I have seen teachers do that. I have seen teachers, even in, in language arts classes, bring writers from all different parts of the world, all different perspectives, to their students' awareness. And I want to give a shout out to the teachers who are already doing that. What I'm hearing is we need a more formalized approach, and we need a more formalized commitment to recognizing the value of, of ethnic studies. And so I think the challenge now is going to be, OK, how do we do this in a way that is going to be organic to what we're doing as a district, um, that's complementing what's already happening, filling in any gaps, and also within our budget. So we're going to need some creative ideas. And one idea that comes to mind for me is let's take a look and see if there's uh, districts or universities that have already developed something that we can, we can use or, or, or you know, crib from so that we can move forward in our current um, budget situation. So those are just a, a few thoughts I wanted to share. 
Along similar lines, I understand that there was recently an identity safety training here in the, um, in the auditorium, I think it was for our principals, and I understand that was really valuable training. And it just reminds me that it would be great if the board could also be privy to some of that sort of training. Maybe we could bring some of it into our, one of our board retreats and even invite the public to, to be a part of it because it's, it's another one of these topics that we'd, we'd all benefit from. Um, another issue that uh, where Seattle has been doing a good job is on the issue of adolescent sleep and health. And there's going to be a national conference on adolescent sleep health and start times, April 27th and 28th in Washington, D.C. And what's interesting is um, Seattle is considered a national leader in this. And a lot more districts are taking a look at what has been done and wanting to do the same thing. In other words, have the bell times correspond to the best biological outcomes for our students and also um, and the needs of our students and w with the goal of having academic and social emotional outcomes that um, will play out well for them. So it's great to be on the cutting edge of something and that's one example. Uh, I'd like to also encourage everybody, speaking of the arts, which we did talk about a little bit tonight, is to go and see the Naramore Art Show, which presents fantastic work by students in, in the Seattle School District, and that'll be at the Seattle Art Museum from April 5th to May 28th. As we all know, the arts are a crucial part of education and just being a, a whole person. And then that, of course, brings me back to the John Muir Elementary uh, Music Recorder uh, group that we had this morning uh, at the beginning of the meeting. And I just want to acknowledge the fact that they did a fantastic job staying in tune, because I do remember when we were taught recorder, and I think that is the first instrument you're usually taught in school. It's sort of the gateway instrument to other things. There, it's a tricky instrument, and it's hard to keep it in tune. And they did, a, they did a great job, and they were absolutely charming. And we, we always appreciate having that sort of introduction to our meetings. <coughs> so I don't know. Oh, just one funny note. So while I'm up here, my phone rang, and it was Seattle Public School District calling me. I think it was a reminder that we have spring break coming up. So I just want to pass that along to everybody. <laughs> so the board is now going to take, speaking of break, if anyone else has anything to add? No? Okay, then we're going to take a 15 minute break and we will, um, we will reconvene, you know, at 6.50 I believe. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>